And so now going back to our original problem that we were looking at, we've now finished number two. Where we've looked at what happens when we add 0.01 molar of this KNO3. The second thing we're going to do, or sorry, the last thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at question three and we're going to see what happens if instead of adding 0.01, we're going to add in 2.0 moles of KNO3. And so in order to solve this, we're going to follow the exact same procedure that we just followed a second ago, only we just now have a different concentration of the salt that we added. So we're going to start with our ionic strength. I is equal to 1 half times the sum over all the ions, which is the sum is over the charge of each ion squared times the mole concentration of each ion divided by the standard mole concentration. The ionic strength is equal to 1 half, and so I'm now going to write out the sum. I have the magnesium ion first, 2 squared, times 1.34 times 10 to the minus 3 divided by 1, plus negative 1 squared times 2.68 times 10 to the minus 3 divided by 1. Now I've got the sodium ion, which is 1 squared times 2 divided by 1, and then I have my nitrate ion, which is negative 1 times, or squared, times 2 divided by 1. And remember, what I, this problem is framed so that we're starting from the equilibrium concentration again before we added any sodium nitrate salt. And so that's where I have this 1.34 times 10 to the minus 3 and 2.68 times 10 to the minus 3 coming from. And again, in this case now, instead of it being 0.01 like I did in the last problem, it's now 2 molar, which is why I've got 2s written right there. So when I simplify this expression, what I get is an ionic strength that's essentially equal to 2. And what we can see here is that the square root of this ionic strength, the square root of 2, well that's going to be much bigger than 0 0.2. And so in this case we have to use the Davies equation if we want to get somewhat close to what is empirically true for the ionic strength, or sorry, the average, average activity coefficient for this um, system. And so that's what we're going to employ next. That means then that the log of the average activity coefficient is going to be equal to negative 0 0.509 times the absolute value of z plus times z minus, and that's going to be all times the square root of the ionic strength divided by 1 plus the square root of the ionic strength minus 0 0.3 times the ionic strength. And so if we start to substitute in numbers, we get the logarithm of the average activity coefficient being equal to negative 0 0.509 times the absolute value of 2 times minus 1. And then I have the square root of 2 divided by 1 plus the square root of 2 minus 0 0.3 times 2. And so if I simplify this expression on the right, I get the logarithm of the average activity coefficient being equal to 0 0.01 Four four seven, which means that my average activity coefficient is now equal to 1.034. And what you'll notice right now is that our average activity coefficient is now greater than 1. And so this is one of those predictors that helps you identify whether or not the solubility of your salt will go up or down. And you can do this based on looking at your average activity coefficient. So let's now take this average activity coefficient and plug it into our equilibrium expression. We're going to use the same one as before, so Ksp is equal to the activity of the magnesium ion times the activity of the fluoride ion squared. We start substituting in numbers, 6.4 times 10 to the minus 9 is equal to, and I have my average activity coefficient, 1.034 times 0 0.00134 plus x times 1.034 times 0 0.00268 plus 2x, all squared. And where this expression is coming from is that we're using the exact same equilibrium expression that we used before. And so hence we can just plug that right in. The only difference from what we had in question two versus now is that the average activity coefficient has just been replaced with the one that fits for the ionic strength of the solution we're talking about. But that means when I simplify this, I get a similar expression that we had before. 6.4 times 10 to the minus 9, that's going to be divided by 4 times 1.034 cubed, and that's equal to 0 0.00134 plus x. 
and this value is raised to the power of 3. Then I'm going to take the cubed root of both sides. And so what I'm left with is 0 0.001131 being equal to 0 0.00134 plus x. And so if I solve for x, in this case I actually get a negative number. I get negative 2.1 times 10 to the minus 4. And so again, this is another one of those indicators that says that we're starting to salt out or that we're going to start to decrease our concentration of ions in solution. And if I calculate the concentration of ions in solution, I have magnesium 2 plus, and how I ca calculated that would be the 0 0.00134 plus x. x in this case is negative 2.1 times 10 to the minus 4. And so what I end up with is 1.13 times 10 to the minus 3. The concentration of my fluoride ions, well that's equal to 0 0.00268 plus 2x. In this case, x is a negative number, so I'm going to say minus 2 times 2.1 times 10 to the minus 4. And that's equal to 2.26 times 10 to the minus 3. And so as you can see, I have now, by adding in a large concentration of sodium nitrate, I've gone from an equilibrium concentration before it was added of 0 0.00134 and 0 0.00268 to a smaller concentration, 1.13 times 10 to the minus 3, 2.26 times 10 to the minus 3. And so this is the phenomenon of salting out, where when we add an extra salt to the solution, we add more ions to the solution, eventually we're going to come to the point where the ions interact with each other of similar charge, which then means that we're going to try to push out ions out of the solution. And the part where that happens in this case is part of this equilibrium expression where we can push out some of these magnesium and fluoride ions. So now I just want to just summarize this process one last time because it's a long process and it's sometimes a lot of things to keep in mind. But what we did was is we ended up first solving for our equilibrium concentration of our ions without taking into account the fact that they were ions. We assumed that it was an ideal solution. And so to do that, we just said, well, our average activity coefficient is equal to 1, meaning that this is an ideal solution, that the ions have no effect on each other. Once we did that, we were able to then calculate our concentration of our ions. And so in this case, this is our concentration of magnesium 2 plus and our concentration of fluoride minus, assuming that our gamma plus minus was equal to 1. Once we had that, then we actually now can have an estimation of these ions in solution. We knew that it wasn't going to be perfect, but it gives us then an ability to calculate for a first iteration what our ionic strength was going to be. And then from that, once we knew our ionic strength, we can now recalculate what is our average activity coefficient, because again, we realize that this isn't an ideal solution, this is a real solution, that we have ions interacting with each other in the solution, and that has an effect on their solubility. And once we have this updated average activity coefficient, we can then calculate then the concentration of our magnesium and our fluoride ions given this new average activity coefficient. That is essentially how we ended up solving problem one. And then once we had solved problem one and we knew our equilibrium concentrations of magnesium and fluoride, and we started adding an extra salt, then what that meant was that we could actually start at step three where we were just then needing to recalculate our ionic strength so then we can then calculate an updated average activity coefficient which then would give us an updated concentration of our magnesium ions and our fluoride ions given this updated average activity coefficient. And so, again, the only reason why I bring this up is that we have these cases where when you start from scratch, when we started in problem one, we had this issue where we needed to find or we needed to know a concentration in order to then be able to solve for an ionic strength, which was then going to give us an average activity coefficient, which then would give us our concentration. And so because we didn't know this concentration to then calculate our ionic strength, we had to then make an assumption where we would say, well, we're going to just set this equal to 1. And then that starts this chain. But once we can actually get into this chain, then we can start inserting ourselves along it to then start recalculating values and setting up this iterative loop where we can get better and better representations of what our concentration is um, just by doing this loop over and over again until our concentrations don't change anymore.
Ions in solution deviate the properties of mixtures from ideal conditions. This deviation is quantified using the average activity coefficient. It can be calculated using the debye huckel limiting law, a theoretically determined expression designed for low ionic strength solutions. Alternatively, for higher ionic strength solutions, we must use empirically determined expressions, such as the Davies equation.